Thank you so much for staying with us for another edition of All Angles, a special edition this evening, digging deeper following the declaration of the state of emergency in St. James. Later on in the program, sports and crime, how the Montego Bay United football team is being affected by all of this. But first, a look at some of the problems plaguing Montego Bay over the years and where from here. A state of public emergency is now in effect for the parish of St. James. A record 335 murders in 2017, some of them brazen daylight killings, had left the residents of St. James feeling that crime in the parish was out of control. In this edition of All Angles, we look at two issues often cited as related to the crime problem in Montego Bay. The approximately 20 squatter communities spread out all over the city and the lottery scam. Member of Parliament for St. James Northwest, Dr. Horace Chang, says squatting is no longer the problem it used to be. It's a big problem, but not necessarily the way it is portrayed. The physical um, environment is a challenge, but we have fixed a significant amount of that. Um, squatting in the context of an informal economy is the bigger issue. And an informal economy can involve both in the, for, in the infrastructure, in the squatting areas as well as non squatting areas. The scale of Montego Bay squatting problem came to light seriously in the 1990s when city leaders began work on a community driven initiative. It is this problem that Horace Chang, an MP and cabinet minister with responsibility for housing, insists has improved significantly. Improvement in terms of, to some extent, physical infrastructure. But it would be foolish to think that uh, physical infrastructure alone, by way of maybe paving some roads and um, putting in the, the necessary utilities, um, by doing that, you are actually solving the squatter problem. There's something called socialization, and therefore there's a social infrastructure that has to be dealt with as well. And that is where we have failed as a community and as a city. I will quickly take you back, Dion, to the 1990s when, and I was part of that group and so was Winston Deere and others, when we met as city stakeholders and took a decision after, interestingly, a discussion on then um, JBC about um, the development of Montego Bay. That discussion laid the foundation for city leaders to mount an ambitious community-led development project. We came back to Montego Bay as a group and decided that the only way Montego Bay was going to move forward is if we cut across partisan lines and come together because the mayor then was also part of that grouping. And so we came back and out of that we formed what was called the Montego Bay City Caucus. And it was chaired jointly by the mayor and the costas so as to not make it look political. Out of that meeting and those um, conversations eventually came what was called the Montego Bay Redevelopment Company. And we realized then that the greatest problem that Montego Bay had, Dion, was the lack of planning, that there needed to be a development plan for the city. And so we set about to create what was called the Montego Bay Greater Development, the Greater Montego Bay Development Company, GMRC. And out of that, a development plan structure was born. That plan, which was interestingly hailed by the United Nations at the Earth Summit then, as one of the success stories of the Caribbean and Latin America, because of its vision, because of what it set out to do. Unfortunately, over a period of time, the plan was frustrated by successive governments who did not see the significance, I suspect. I remember even when I was member of parliament, I brought the issue to my own government, and I got very little response. Um, Eventually, we were told under the Bruce Golding administration that we are going to now look at a St. James development plan. I don't know where that is now. It was turned over to the UDC. But then again, from what I've seen of the, the UDC's efforts, it's again primarily physical infrastructure. And there is this sort of underlying sort of feeling that, hey, we must develop this thing in order 
to make the tourists more comfortable and to give them more attractions. Nonsense. Lloyd B. Smith says the seeds of Montego Bay's current problems grew out of the city's two main industries. The reason why Montego Bay is in the problem that it is today are two factors, ironically, that came out of the two major economic activities that are now in the city, tourism and, 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 and um, the call centre, BPO. How did it happen? Tourism attracted persons from all across the island. They are the ones who initiated most of the squatting. The BPO, that's where the, the, the scamming all started. That's where the, the, the scammers got the lists from, from workers working there. So when those factors are brought into play, if we had dealt with these problems at the very outset, realizing the consequences thereof, I remember then um, police, um, I think it was assistant commissioner at the time, um, Denver Freighter warned that if this coming is not nipped in the bud, and this was several years ago, we are going to play, face consequences because it's going to reach a stage where the scammers would be better armed and more financially uh, sustainable than the rest of us. Looking back, former chairman of the Greater Montego Bay Redevelopment Company, Winston Dare, maintains that the work that was done was critical. When you have in informal um, communities, there's no infrastructure in place. Therefore, there's no recreational facilities for the people. They build houses without um, providing roads, so there's emergency services, and, and, and maybe right now, currently, the, the police um, cannot go to those areas. Uh, easily. Mr. Dare points to other negative effects of the way in which the city's sprawling squatter communities developed. This has generated a whole generation of people that live like this, that live from day to day, that, that are always afraid of authority. Authority is not their friend because they are, uh, they are, they are um, occupying illegal space. So the DMRC sought to try and rectify that situation by formalizing those communities. Lloyd B. Smith believes that the development of the squatter settlements is an example of the lack of collective action to address the city's problems. In 1997, there were 17 squatter settlements identified. Today, it's over 21 and growing. And yes, as Dr. Chang and others may say, you have put in physical infrastructure, but there's no socialization. You say we fixed a lot of it, meaning what? I mean, some years ago, the assessment had been that there were 19 squatter yeah. communities in but and around Mobi. The, the, the big ones, for example, most of now do have, have road, which means access. All of our flanker has adequate roadways. Um, some of them are refixing again, and most of Providence. You're looking at over 20,000 housing units in those areas. So, and so work has been done in section of Granville, not as much as has been done in this area. And we're looking at other areas. Some work has been done up in Anchovy, in Red Ground, and in Copwood work is being done now. So we have been able to move fairly well into the squat area in terms of infrastructure, which creates a physical environment and has benefit to in terms of restoring a sense of order and allowing the police access, allowing the garbage trucks access, and so forth. Water is not as yet a satisfactory level, but that kind of activity brings about a difference in the approach of the citizens. Plus, we have titled pretty much all of Norwood and Flanker in Providence, again, giving a greater sense of ownership, which has helped to create a, a, a better sense of order. But Lloyd B. Smith maintains that central government's disregard of the tremendous work done by the Greater Montego Bay Redevelopment Company has had long-lasting effects. That was the end of all the efforts after millions of dollars were spent within the confines of between the chamber and the and some members of the private sector and the Greater Montego Radio Company and the Parish Council. That went to naught. That document, I still have most of those documents somewhere in my archives. And one of the major emphases in that plan was to deal with the inner city communities and the squatter communities. A plan that was hailed by the United Nations to this day is now gathering dust somewhere. And this is why we are now in the situation that we are in there. And indeed, a United Nations document referred to the plan's, quote, unparalleled, non-partisan community mobilization for development. 
you mentioned that the some work has been done over the years. Would you say that um, we're at a stage in Montego Bay now where this is no longer a significant concern? Do you think the police have ready access to most of the communities now, for instance? The, the police have access to a lot of them. Uh, Upper King Street is still a major issue. And the, the, the problem too with that and, and maybe Canterbury is that uh, they, 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 they actually live on the gully systems, uh, near the gully systems, which are a problem in terms of, of a disaster preparedness. So we have to still deal with that issue and, and, and get them off of those gullies. Um, and Mr. Chang is very um, committed, um, Minister Chang, to do that. Um, and then um, what we want to do is at the UDC, we would like to create a longitudinal parks in all of those gully systems where people can, can have uh, recreational facilities and, and you move the people out of there into more formal settlements. So was the work of the GMRC wasted? Winston Dare insists that it was not. The um, development plans that have been done around the country since has reflected the methodology and, and the whole planning exercise that we are doing. The development orders before were very sketchy and didn't really get into the communities. Now, the new development orders, and I'm going to take credit for that, our group, have detailed planning for each community within the parish. So we, we know we have made an impact. Um, we didn't get everything that we wanted, but it's certainly on the right track. Because initially I know there was a concern that all this money had been spent, all this work was being done, yeah. and there wasn't any action or implementation, especially with you know the regularization of all those communities. Looking back, though, um, waste of time or not? No, not a waste of time, no. Um, well, well, once you get the, the planning exercises, it always takes a long time to implement plans. So remember, still to come, the Montego Bay footballers speak out. But first, some more on some of these issues affecting Montego Bay. Stay tuned, soon come.